They're adorable. I know they're cute. I'm not going to lie, they're cute. <laughs> Okay, we are going to get started. We're going to finish your chapter 17 with the 17 people that are left. You guys would like to see the crowd. You're here. Um, a couple things. I forgot to make a real reminder slide. This is the one that's left over. I uh, have a quiz today. So don't forget that you have a quiz today. Don't forget that you have a quiz today. This is your last quiz. Okay, your last homework is posted and it is due on Monday. That's your last homework. The end is near. Okay, last quiz, last homework. Um, your final, we will talk about the final when we, we get back from Thanksgiving a little bit more what the format's going to look like. It's not going to look dramatically different. If you're in chemistry, I know you're taking a standardized like, multiple choice final. We are not taking a standardized multiple choice final because there is no standardized multiple choice final. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about the format because hopefully by the week after Thanksgiving, I'll have a better idea of what it will look like. I have a big idea. Uh, so, questions about schedule. Let's do when. Homework is Monday. Quiz is when? Today. today. You're not going to forget because the quiz is today and it's your last quiz. Okay, we left off. We did not quite finish this slide. This is the very end of our process of transcription. What are the three pages of transcription? Initiation, elongation, termination. Okay, initiation, elongation, termination. Initiation, we form that transcription complex that has transcription factors in RNA polymerase 2. Elongation, we just continually add those mRNA bases until you get to the back codon, which is the termination, telling us to stop, telling the mRNA, the RNA polymerase to stop. Making RNA in a eukaryotic cell, we make not RNA really in that process. We technically are making pre RNA. And we said, talked about a couple different ways that the RNA is processed. Pre RNA is processed into a mature RNA. So, what are some of the ways that the RNA, pre RNA, is processed into mature RNA, mRNA? Some of them are up there. All of them are up there. What can you add? Modified genes. So you can alter the ends. So on the three, on the five prime end, you can add a cap. That's the modified guanine base. That is a five prime cap. What else can you do on the other end? You can add lots of A's. The poly A tail is added to the three prime ends. Those are two ways that you can alter the ends. We also talked about these UTRs, these untranslated regions. There's a five prime UTR and a three prime UTR. So they are not translated, meaning they are not turned into protein or polypeptide, but they help with binding. Um, and so they're useful, but they're not useful for making, a, they're not actually making the protein. They're not expressed as a protein. And we left off, we were talking about the last way that we process RNA, which is RNA splicing. And I think we kind of touched on it really, really quick but I want to make sure we cover it. Um, RNA slicing, splicing, not slicing. Wow. 
It's going to be a long day. RNA splicing is when we're cutting out these regions of the mRNA that are called introns. So there are introns and there are extrons. Exons, not extrons. Wow. It's like that doesn't sound right because it's not the right word. That's why. There are introns and there are exons. So the introns are these regions that are just cut out. And the exons are what are kept and spliced together. So introns are non-coding regions. On the exons are coding regions, obviously. So there's a complex that does this that's called the spliceosome. Sometimes our names make sense. Okay, spliceosome is a conglomeration of the, it's both proton proteins, how? And some RNA molecules. So you have some proteins and some RNA molecules that are able to actually cut out pieces of the pre-mRNA and then join together these dark orange sections, which are the exons, which are the sections that are needed to go out. So they will bind, the spliceosome binds to the ends of an intron and then catalyzes the splicing. The discovery of the spliceosomes led scientists to actually understand it's not just enzymes that can be used to catalyze reactions. There are pieces of RNA that are called ribozymes, which are able to catalyze reactions. So ribozymes are RNA that can catalyze a reaction. So they're taking these useful sections of DNA, splicing them together so that this mature RNA, this mature mRNA has just the coding segments in it. So we've got the coding segments, we've got the untranslated regions, and then we have the five prime cap and the poly A tail. And that is a mature RNA molecule. That is now ready to exit the nucleus. Where is it going? Where does mRNA go to be translated? What is going to translate the mRNA from mRNA into a polypeptide? What, what part of the cell is going to make polypeptides? The ribosomes, and where are we going to find ribosomes? could be on the endoplasmic reticulum. And some of them are also free ribosomes. So they're out and about just floating around in the cytoplasm. So this mRNA now is ready to exit the nucleus. This is going to leave the nucleus. Because remember, this is only happening in eukaryotic cells. This processing only happens in eukaryotic cells, which have a nucleus. So it's going to leave the nucleus and it's going to go... out to the cytoplasm. So we've talked about the first half of the central dogma biology. The central dogma biology says DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein. So we have talked about DNA making RNA, that's transcription. Now we have to talk about the second part, which is RNA makes proteins. And that is translation. So that's where we're going next. So this, again, we're going to do the same kind of thing. We're going to talk about a brief overview of the process, and then we are going to talk about some of the details of some of the players in the process, and then we're going to talk about some of the details about how, how, about how it happens. So this is translation. This is section 17.4 in the book, and this is taking RNA and making a polypeptide or a protein. 
And again, we're calling it translation. Why? Why do we call this translation? When I, you translate something, what are you doing? Changing the language. So we're changing from the language of nucleic acid, RNA, DNA and RNA, nucleic acids, and now we're changing to the language of amino acid. So we're translating this message of a nucleic acid into an amino acid. And we need the help of all these players that are in this picture. Um, you can see here, we have a ribosome. We're gonna bring in a different kind of RNA. Well, two different kinds of RNA here. We were talking about mRNA, which is messenger RNA. We're also going to now incorporate tRNA. Anyone know what the T stands for? Transfer, I have to look it up because I couldn't remember. <laughs> Transfer RNA, I was like, is it what? And I was like, I should know this. And on this transfer RNA, you see a series of bases again, three bases. When we're talking about three sets of three bases on mRNA, what do we call it? Those sets of three are called what? Codons. Oh, wow, hello. So those are codons on the tRNA. So mRNA carries codons on the tRNA. These are called anticodons. They're not opposed to the codons. They're actually complementary to the codons. So I don't know why we call them anti-codons, but they're anti-codons. This is our mRNA feeding through. This is the polypeptide that we're making. And you can see all these amino acids floating around. So some of these amino acids are floating around free. Some of them are connected to the tRNA. When a tRNA has an amino acid attached to it, we call it a charged tRNA. So a charged tRNA is a tRNA molecule that has the attached amino acid. And you can see there's three different sites, three different places that tRNAs are interacting with the ribosome. So we're going to talk about this process and how we get from this mRNA to this polypeptide using these different molecules. But before we do that, we're gonna talk about a little bit of detail about what a tRNA actually looks like. So this is the anatomy of a tRNA molecule. Most tRNA molecules are about 80 bases long. Because it's made of um, RNA, we know it's a single helix. It's got the one sugar phosphate backbone with the bases sticking up. So about 80 base pairs long, not base pairs because it's not pairs. I will say that over and over and I will try to correct myself every time. It's about 80 bases. So these 80 bases will form a specific configuration. And that configuration, you'll see there's three different regions where there's four or five bases that are paired up together that make loops. And then this region, there's no loop. So a tRNA has three loops. So a lot of people talk, look at it as like a clover structure. In 3D, it doesn't really look like a clover structure. It looks like this, but it's got three loops. There's hydrogen bonds forming between the bases <coughs> that are holding those loops together. And at the three prime end here, there's the same sequence. At the three prime end of every tRNA, there's an ACC sequence, and that is where the amino acid binds. So this is the amino acid attachment site, and it's always that ACC. The order of the bases, this order differs because there's a different tRNA for all of the different amino acids. But they always attach at that ACC on the three prime end. The anticodon that's down here so the anticodon is kind of at the opposite end of where the amino acid attaches. This is unique because the three, that three order of those three bases is going to be unique to that tRNA based on which amino acid it's going to attach. So again, this is what it looks like in 2D, this kind of cloverleaf shape. 
what it looks like in 3D. Some people talk about it like an L that's bent. It's kind of got this bent bend in it. You don't see the loops as clearly, but here's where the anticodon is attached. Here's the three prime amino acid attachment site. And this is what it looks like in all our drawings. This kind of, I don't know what it looks like. Some kind of weird hippopotamus, I don't know. So it's got the anticodon and the amino acid site. The anticodons we always write, we always write the codon in a five prime to three prime orientation and the anticodon we always write in a three prime to five prime orientation. So sometimes you'll see the, and the codon is actually written like five prime G, G, C, three prime. And then the anticodon would be what? If the codon is G, C, C, what would be complementary to that? G is going to pair with C, G is going to pair with, C is going to pair with, that would be an anticodon. So this would be on the mRNA, and this is on the tRNA. So the process of charging, an, uh, charging a tRNA is the process of attaching that amino acid to the tRNA at the amino acid attachment site. So this involves what? What makes everything happen in biology? An enzyme. Okay, and actually in this case, we're not gonna talk about one enzyme, we're talking about 20 different enzymes because how many amino acids are there? There's 20 amino acids, so there's a different enzyme to attach every amino acid to its tRNA. So there's 20 different enzymes that look like this. This is just an example, this is the tyrosine one. This is tyrosyl tRNA synthetase. This will attach tyrosine to a tRNA. Now remember when we talked about the code? Oh, I took that slide out because I thought I should take it out. Um, we talked about the fact that there, there's more than one amino, more than one anticodon or more than one codon that codes for the same amino acid. We said that the DNA code is redundant or degenerate because there's more than one code for each amino, for some amino acids. Um, so tyrosine, T tyrosol tRNA synthetase will attach tyrosine to any of the tRNAs anticodons that attach to ty the tyrosine attaches to. So if there's more than one codon for tyrosine, this one works for all of those. So there's only 20 of them. There's not 61 of them. So the way that this happens is we've got an amino acid. So the way the charging process happens, and in this case, we're talking about tyrosine. And this is going to be our anticodon down here. So this is just our tRNA. And this is the specific TYR tRNA because it's going to bind tyrosine. So the amino acid and the tRNA enter the active site of the enzyme. So they both are going to fit into that active site. And again, this is specific. These enzymes have specificity for the amino acid that's going to be joined to that tRNA. So only the tyrosine tRNA is going to fit in here and only the tyrosine amino acid is going to fit in there. This is not an exergonic process. What's the opposite of exergonic? Endergonic. It takes energy. So ATP is going to become AMP. So we're using the energy from those phosphate bonds to create the bond between the amino acid and the tyrosine um, tRNA. So we're going to use, a, use ATP and we're going to catalyze that bond. And it's a covalent bond. Once this is charged, it's then released. This is showing you more of the space filling model of what it actually looks like. So here's the tRNA, here's the enzyme, and here's the amino acid. That looks more like what it looks like in a 3D structure. Remember we said that a lot of times when the same, when a codon codes for more than one amino acid, which position of the codon is different? 
Maybe you don't remember the reason. The third one. The third one is usually the one that's different. That's there's a couple where that's not always true, but oftentimes if something is coding for the same amino acid, and I'm just making up things here and I shouldn't do this, but we'll pretend that these three all code for the same amino acid. It's the third position that's different. Again, these all, this enzyme can work for all three of these anti-codons or codons because of what we call wobble. There's a little flexibility for that third base pair, that third base that is not a base pair, that third base, and that's just called wobble. So there's flexibility a little bit in the enzyme to cut, catalyze that reaction between these different codons because of this idea of wobble. Last but not least, we're going to talk about ribosomes. So we've mentioned ribosomes before. We've talked about ribosomes in the context of they're in cells and they make proteins. What kinds of cells have ribosomes? Eukaryotic cells? Prokaryotic cells. So that means all the cells. Because everybody, all cells need to make proteins. What's this is why we don't talk about ribosomes as being a nucleus, nuclear bound membrane. Membrane bound ribosome. Let's try this again. This is why we don't talk about ribosomes being membrane bound organelles. There we go. Okay. They're not membrane bound organelles. That, and that's why prokaryotic cells can happen because they need to make proteins too. They're not even technically an organelle, they're actually made up primarily of RNA. So they're made up of R, oh, R RNA, which is ribosomal RNA. So that's a specific kind of RNA that is part of the ribosome. And they're made up of proteins. So RNA, RNA makes about two thirds of a ribosome and proteins make up the last third of the ribosome. Way, way, way back when we talked about the structure of a cell, where did we say that ribosomes were made in a eukaryotic cell? It goes way back. It's like a built-in review for you. Hmm? Somebody say something? They're not made in the cytoplasm. In a eukaryotic cell, they're actually made in the nucleolus. And they're assembled in two parts. There's a large subunit and a small subunit. So those two subunits don't actually come together until they're making a protein. So in the cell, there are just large subunits of ribosomes and small subunits of ribosomes floating around in the cytoplasm until the mRNA comes in and they bind together to start translating that mRNA into a polypeptide. There are differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic ribosomes. Um, we can talk about them as being pretty similar, but they're different enough that we can target them with drugs. Um, so when you have an illness that's bacterial, Sometimes you take antibiotics like streptomycin or tetracycline. Those two antibiotics specifically are antibiotics that target the ribosomes of a bacteria. If they target the ribosomes of the bacteria, what does that mean for the bacteria? It can't make proteins, so it's going to die eventually. I mean, they don't have a really long lifespan. So if you can target something that specifically will affect only the bacteria, it doesn't affect your eukaryotic cells when you take that antibiotic, it's not going to affect your ribosomes because they're structurally different enough. We can target just specifically bacterial ribosomes, and that can prevent protein synthesis in a bacteria, which can prevent an infection from spreading. Um, so again, these two subunits come together when it's binding, and you'll see we have three different sites here. We have the P site which stands for peptidyl tRNA. This is where the polypeptide is going to be as it is being built. It's in the P site. And the this, oh, this site is the A site, which is the amino acyl site.
This is where the next charged tRNA is coming in. So the next amino acid that's going to be added hangs out in the A site. It's like the waiting room until it can be added to the polypeptide. And then E is the exit site. The exit site is where the uncharged tRNA is going to exit the ribosome. Uncharged meaning it doesn't have what? It doesn't have the amino acid anymore. So a charged tRNA has an amino acid. Once that amino acid is added to this polypeptide, the uncharged tRNA is going to leave. It's going to leave and it's going to be able to get another amino acid added to it. It gets charged again and it can come back in and enter in the process again. So this is, again, this is the next amino acid to be added. This is a tRNA that's charged. This is an uncharged tRNA. Leaving the E site. And the exit tunnel here, this is where the polypeptide is growing and leaving. Once it's done being synthesized. So this shows you just the binding sites, and then this shows you kind of what it looks like in action. Do you feel like we're ready to actually talk about translation now? We've given an overview. We've talked about the parts. We've talked about what tRNA looks like. We've talked about what how tRNA gets charged. We've talked about what a ribosome looks like, and now we can talk about how we actually will make some proteins. And you'll notice some similarities here. There's the same three phases. Initiation elongation, termination. Okay, same process names. You just have to make sure that you're thinking about them clearly in your head. When we're talking about transcription, we're talking about making <clears throat> mRNA. When we're talking about translation, we're talking about making proteins. So transcription initiation has some similarities to translation initiation, but where the goal of the process is different. So translation initiation, is going to be looking, starting always with, I have like four more classes to learn how to not make the slide advance. I'm not optimistic. It's going to start with the initiator TNA, tRNA, initiator. So the first start, step of initiation is that the initiator tRNA is going to bind. The initiator, initiator tRNA is always the same. Okay, it always has the start codon AUG, which gives us the anticodon UAC, which codes for the amino acid methionine. Always. That's always how we start. AUG is the only start codon always is going to bond with UAC. It's always going to start with methionine. So at this point, you'll see that the small ribosomal subunit is going to bind. So once this tRNA binds to the mRNA, the small ribosomal subunit is going to bind to the mRNA. And it's going to bind to the five prime cap. Remember we said that was important for binding of the ribosome? It really is. Okay, it's going to bind to that five prime cap of the mature mRNA. This all takes some energy. So it's endergonic again. Once the small ribosomal has subunit has bound to the mRNA, then the large subunit comes in. And it's going to start, it's going to bind. So now we have completed the translation 
initiation complex. So this consists of the two ribosomal subunits, the small and the large. It consists of the mRNA, the tRNA, the initiator tRNA. And there are some, also some initiation, initiation um, factors, which are like transcription factors, which are just proteins. So the, we have a complete transcription initiation complex of the ribosomal subunits, the mRNA, the tRNA, and the initiation factors. So notice that mRNA is running five prime to three prime, which means we're gonna synthesize, we're gonna, we're gonna match up three prime to five prime. Um, the polypeptide that we're gonna make is synthesized in the N terminus to the C terminus direction. So remember what, way back when, when we talked about the structure of an amino acid, it had a carboxyl end, and on the other side, it had an amino group. That's the N end, and then it also has the R group and a hydrogen ion atom. So we're going to synthesize in this direction. So we're adding those amino acids in this direction because every time we add an amino acid, we're going to form what kind of bond? What kind of bond occurs between amino acids? A peptide bond. Yep. So that peptide bond is the C-N bond. that will be forming. But at this point, all we've done is added one amino acid. And that's methionine. We're in the P position. So this is in the P site. We've got everything there. We're ready to go. So after initiation comes Elongation. We're going to make that polypeptide longer because one amino acid isn't going to do us any good. Okay. So we're going to start at the top of this cycle. And we have, they've already added a couple amino acids on there. But we've got a tRNA there. We've got a charged tRNA coming into the A site. So the polypeptide is here in the P site. The charged amino acid is coming in to the A site. This is the carboxylic end of the polypeptide. That's where we're adding on to the C terminus. This is the N terminus. And we're gonna start with codon recognition. It's not just any tRNA that's coming in. It's the tRNA that has the anticodon that is complementary. So it's, it's specific because it's reading this as directions and it has to read the right direction. So the codon is going to come in. Um, we're gonna have the anticodon. They bind with hydrogen bonds. So we've got this, this in here, we've got the growing polypeptide here, we've got the amino acid here, and this takes a little bit of energy. So this is also an endergonic process. Because we're forming bonds, it happens faster, it's more accurate, and it's more efficient if it uses energy. So it uses some energy. Maybe, maybe someday I'll get there. So it's an endergonic process. Okay, at this point, we're going to form our first peptide bond even though there's already some there. So you'll notice we have our polypeptide here. It's actually going to be transferred from the P site to the amino acid in the A site. So the polypeptide bond forms when the P, the polypeptide, 
the peptide bond forms, when the polypeptide is bound by a peptide bond to the amino acid in the A site. So the growing polypeptide is actually transferred here. We make this peptide bond. So now in the P site, we have an uncharged TNA, RNA. It's got nothing on it anymore. We have the polypeptide attached in the A site. We're gonna use a little bit more energy and we're gonna do translocation. So this ribosome is gonna shift down. This, the one that was in the A site, so the A tRNA is gonna to move to the P tRNA site. And the P tRNA is going to move to the E tRNA site and it's going to exit. So everything shifts down. Now the polypeptide is in the exit tunnel here. And we're ready to start all over again. We bring in another tRNA into the A site. We transfer the polypeptide, forming a peptide bond to the A site. Everything shifts over and this uncharged TNA, tRNA exits to move to go get charged again, and we just keep adding and adding and adding and adding. That's elongation. I always remember this as what order they go in as it is the word ape backwards. Does this make sense? You could also remember it's EPA, which is like the Environmental Protection Agency, but I always remember it's ape backwards because that's kind of the way that it fills in that makes sense in my brain. If that doesn't make sense in your brain, then pretend I didn't say it and just remember EPA and the way it works, however it works for you. Okay, so this is elongation. This is just gonna keep going and going and going until we get to termination, which is the end of this process. Termination happens when we hit the stop codon. There are actually three stop codons. There are three choices, UAA, UAG, and UGA are the three stop codons. So it doesn't matter which one you get to. These stop codons have no amino acid attached to them because their only job is to say stop. So when we say that there are 61 possible co codon combinations, there's really only six, there's 64, sorry, there's 61 that code for amino acids and three that code for stop codons. Some of you need a stop codon for your mouth. So when we get to the translation termination part, we're gonna hit the ribosome is gonna reach a stop codon. And again, it can be any of those three, it doesn't matter. When it gets to the stop codon on the mRNA, that's gonna trigger the, this to come in. Instead of a tRNA, there's a protein that's going to enter that's uh, called the release factor. So it's a protein. It looks like a tRNA, it's shaped like a tRNA, so it fits in to the A site of the tRNA. That release factor is going to promote hydrolysis. So everything's gonna fall apart at this point. There's no more tRNAs. Whoa. There's a free polypeptide, the polypeptide is released. A little bit of energy is involved and everything dissociates. So the subunits will dissociate. And everything goes on its merry little way until it's time to make some more proteins.
So we talked about this process happening in the cytoplasm, but we also mentioned that it happens, we know because some ribosomes are bound to what kind of ER? What kind of endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes bound to it? Rough ER. So there's smooth ER, which is dealing more with like lipid synthesis, and then there's rough ER, which is dealing with protein synthesis. So sometimes these ribosomes are bound directly to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, that happens as part of the translation process. And I think we will finish that today. We'll do our activity on Monday because we're not going to just finish today and have time to do it. So we'll talk about this process now about how the ribosomes get bound to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane and why that's important. And I feel like I should have added another slide in here too, but um, we'll talk first about this process that you see here. And then we'll talk about post-translational modifications because there are modifications that are make, made to the proteins after they've been translated. So there's pre are pre-mRNA processing after transcription happens and there's post-translational post modifications that occur after the protein is actually translated. So this is showing you how the process of, an R of a ribosome getting bound to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane happens. So this is how to make a bound ribosome. So binding it to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So even if it's a bound ribosome, ribosomes can go back and forth between being a free ribosome and a bound ribosome. So it's not that ribosomes are bound there and they stay there all the time, or that ribosomes are in the cytoplasm and they stay there all the time. They can go back and forth. They have different functions. They make different kinds of proteins depending on where they are, but all ribosomes are able to translate any, any mRNA. So it doesn't matter what the code is. So free ribosomes are gonna make proteins that are needed in the cytoplasm or the cytosol, bound RNA, bound ribosomes that are bound to the ER are gonna make ones that are part of the endomembrane system. So like the nuclear membranes and all those things, the proteins that are in there, or they might make secretory proteins, things like insulin are ma made by these bound endoplasmic reticulum proteins. So it starts with a couple different things. An SRP, and I don't have enough room. I'm going to try. This is a signal recognition particle. So here you can see this is all already bound together. But this polypeptide that's being made at the very beginning, that beginning sequence, those beginning amino acids are what we call a signal peptide. So this is about 20 amino acids long. No, sorry, it's near, sorry, I read that wrong. It's going to be, it's in the first 20 amino acids. It's around the 20 amino acid mark from the beginning of the synthesis of the protein. So as the protein starts to be made within those first 20 amino acids, you get this special signal peptide. The signal peptide is going to, trigger this signal recognition particle to bind. So the SRP is going to bind to the signal peptide. And down here we have a receptor, remember cell communication, chapter 11, everyone's favorite chapter. This is a signal reception, an SRP receptor protein. So when the SRP binds to the signal peptide, I know it's small, sorry. When the SRP binds to the signal peptide, that is going to then bind the ribosome. This SRP receptor protein is going to bind to the SRP itself. So this is what's going to bind the ribosome. So the SRP to the SRP receptor protein. Guys, it's really distracting to me. I've been distracted the whole class. It's hard for me to focus when I can hear you talking constantly and it's distracting to other people. If you want to talk, just leave and go talk somewhere else. I have five minutes left and I need it. 
So that SRP is going to bind to the signal receptor protein, and that's going to, you can see, line up this exit tunnel in the P site of the ribosome so that the polypeptide now, instead of just kind of going off into the cytoplasm, is now going to be put into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. That SRP is going to dissociate, and then it can go back and bind to another ribosome to bind another ribosome to the endoplasmic reticulum. But this is just going to keep making these polypeptides. Eventually, once this polypeptide is made, it's going to cleave. It's going to take off that signal peptide because it's not part of the protein structure itself. It was just there to say, hey, bind to the ribosome and bind to the ER to make this specific protein. So it's cut off. It's removed. And again, once it gets to the stop codon, everything dissociates. So this ribosome, these ribosome parts can go back and they can be a cytoplasm-free ribosome. It's not that they're permanently bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. They're just there because of this signal peptide that says, hey, this protein needs to be deposited into the lumen of the ER. So everything, all of the translation process happens starting in the cytoplasm. Sometimes it binds, sometimes it doesn't bind. And again, it depends on the function of the protein, whether it needs to bind to the ER or not bind to the ER. You can see here, this is an end, this is an um, electron microscope drawing showing you that this happens often all at the same time. So we have multiple ribosomes moving down the same mRNA and translating at the same time. So we can make a lot of proteins at the same time. We call this a polyribosomal, a polyribosome. So this is multiple ribosomes can do translation at the same time. So we can get a lot of protein product. So it's simultaneous translation. And this is where I wish that I had more space on the slide. Under what? Right next to ribosome here. Oh, it says multiple ribosomes. I don't know why you can't read that. It's so nice and neat. I have this dream that someday my handwriting will get better. And that I won't advance the slide accidentally. Okay, so in this process, we're making polypeptides. Polypeptides really, as we kind of reviewed, only are the primary structure of proteins. This primary structure that we are making in this translation process, the structure, the order of the amino acids determines the rest of the structure. So it's gonna determine the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and if it has it, quaternary structure. Remember a secondary structure of a protein, what is it? When we take the protein, the polypeptide, and we twist it or we fold it, we can get those alpha helixes or the beta pleated sheets. So that happens after these are made. The tertiary structure happens with, because of different interactions between the side chains. Those R groups that are found on the amino acids interact in different ways, like sulfide bridges and things like that. That's the tertiary structure. And then you can take a bunch of them and put them together, a bunch of polypeptides, and that's the quaternary structure. So we can modify these polypeptides to affect these structures also with post-translational modifications. And that might be where we have to imagine and think about this all weekend. What do you need to do today? Take the quiz. What is due on Monday? Homework. Homework. I will see you on Monday.